Hey guys, it's Savvy Sabs, and I have a special guest with me today. His name is Lee Carter. He represents the 50th District for Virginia House of Delegates. He's a socialist and he's running for governor of Virginia. Welcome, Lee. Thank you so much for having me on. Thanks for coming. So before we get started, Lee, can you tell everyone a little bit about your background? Yeah, so I don't come from a normal background for a politician. I'm not a doctor or a lawyer. I'm not wealthy. Uh, I'm a, an enlisted Marine Corps veteran and an electronics repairman. And I got involved in politics after I got hurt at work in the summer of 2015. Uh, and I had to deal with the workers' compensation system. And I started going to people that I knew that worked in and around Virginia politics and asking them, what are you going to do to fix workers' comp? Because this system is completely broken. And nobody had an answer. And so it was a very Mr. Smith goes to Washington kind of thing. I realized, uh, well, I should have realized at the time that Mr. Smith goes to Washington is a cautionary tale. But, <laughs> but I realized that if, if anyone was going to actually fight for working people, it was going to have to be someone who had been on the receiving end of, of these system failures, you know, these systems that are supposed to be there to protect us. Uh, and I took on a fight that the Democratic Party said was impossible. Uh, I took on an 11 year incumbent, a guy who was a, a part of Republican Party leadership in a district that was gerrymandered specifically for him in 2011 and uh, got thousands of people out to vote who had never voted in a general assembly race before uh, because I was talking about the issues that actually mattered in their life. Uh, and my campaign was, instead of being funded by big corporate interests, my campaign was completely funded uh, by working class people. And, and so, you know, those two things together, the message being different and actually walking the walk and, and you know, stepping outside of the, the corruption that people see every day, um, it, it got people to go out and, and vote. And that's exactly the same sort of thing uh, that I'm bringing to this race for governor. You know, I think that we're in a moment here in Virginia where we've got crisis after crisis after crisis, right? Um, we started off with a crisis of housing affordability Virginia, despite having more empty houses than homeless people, still has five out of the 10 cities in America with the highest eviction rates. Um, and, and people are just being squeezed out of their homes by ever increasing rent. Uh, we've got a crisis of uh, police violence against people. We've got a crisis of uh, an economic system that just does not work for the overwhelming majority of us. And then add on top of that, the new crises of COVID-19 and the economic collapse that it brought. And this really was a moment where uh, I was not hearing anything from the rest of the field uh, that was big enough and credible enough that, that, that I thought that any of them were up to this moment that we're in. And so I decided to throw my hat in the ring and run for governor. And uh, we're gonna go out there and we're gonna try to reach, uh, in this case, hundreds of thousands of, of people who have never voted in a gubernatorial primary before and give them a chance to vote for something truly different. Awesome. So Lee, you and I have a couple things in common. We were both military kids. Mm -hmm. uh, both of us have lived in Virginia, you um, longer than me. And so I, I got to ask in reference to Virginia, because I know this question is going to come up. How did a socialist win in Virginia? Well, you look at, uh, you look at the political system that we have, and people are dissatisfied just everywhere. Uh, if, you, if you take the 2016 election, for example, the, the, the presidential election, if none of the above were a candidate, none of the above would have won, what, 43, 44 states? Uh, because there are people out there who say, um, Republicans don't care about me and Democrats don't fight for me. So why should I bother? And the way that I got elected as you know, I'm, I'm the only socialist elected to any Southern legislature, I was the first socialist elected to any office in Virginia in over a century. Um, and I hope to become the first socialist governor in America's history is because I'm actually talking about the real economic problems that people are facing and giving an alternative. You know, as governor, we're, we're gonna, when, when I'm governor of Virginia, we're gonna discontinue all of these programs where Virginia's government has been giving away tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to big business, right? We gave $1.8 billion worth of cash, tax credits, 
and infrastructure investments to Amazon, a company that doesn't pay any taxes, that's owned by the richest man who's ever lived. I mean, richer than the pharaohs, rich, richest man that's ever lived. And we gave it to him. And in exchange, what he has to do is bring 30,000 new people into Northern Virginia to make our rent go up. You know, our, our, our economic system under our current politi political leadership just doesn't make sense. And so I'm proposing that we take that money and instead put it into the hands of working Virginians so that we can say, you know, here's the money that you need to start your own employee owned enterprise. So that, uh, you know, when you go to work, it's you that owns the workplace. It's you that are making the decisions, right? And when the next economic crisis hits, it's not Jeff Bezos deciding whether or not to fire people in Virginia, it's the people of Virginia. And of course, we're not gonna do it, right? We're gonna find other ways to tighten the belt and that's better for everybody. Yes, indeed. Um, I know a lot of people assume that Virginia, because it's in the South, and the South typically has a lower cost of living, that Virginia also would have a lower cost of living. But I know when I lived in Virginia, I thought Virginia was expensive. And like, yeah. I'm in Massachusetts, but there's parts of, I would say, especially Northern Virginia, right outside of DC, that are is pretty close uh, cost of living wise to what we have here in the Boston area. Yeah, I mean, I'm an hour outside of DC if there's no traffic and there's never no traffic. Um, and, you know, even out here, I'm paying almost two grand a month for a two bedroom apartment. It's the cheapest place in town. Um, and, you know, with, with the Amazon deal that I mentioned earlier, a lot of people asked me, you know, Lee, why are you, why are you opposing this so hard? You know, this is in Arlington. This is 40 miles away from where you live. Why do you care? It's not going to impact your constituents. But the reality is that it does impact my constituents. I mean, in my building, rent went up 18% in a month because of that announcement and nothing else. That was before a single shovel hit the ground, before a single person got hired. 18% increase in rent in a building an hour away. So, you know, the, the things that we're doing um, have a much, much bigger impact on, on people's lives in ways that most of the General Assembly um, and most of the candidates uh, for governor just don't consider because they see that headline, right? 30,000 new jobs and they, they can't pass that up, but they don't actually think about whether or not it's a net positive or a net negative for the people they're supposed to represent. And in reference to the new jobs, who would you say most of those jobs are for? Are they for college educated people or are they for people that you know have high school diploma? Like who would you say most of those jobs are for? Well, it's their headquarters. So um, it is people that are on the higher end of the education scale. Uh, but the biggest thing is it's people that are transferring in. Uh, you know, the, the overwhelming majority of these folks that are gonna be working at the new Amazon headquarters are coming from Seattle, they're coming from California, they're coming from Pennsylvania, um, and they were already doing all right there. And so we're bringing people in that were already doing well uh, to try to pad our own numbers and say, look how much we've improved things on average, but we're not actually helping the people that are struggling. Um, we're just sort of pushing them out and, and covering them up with uh, new people that don't need the help. Yeah, um, so we have a similar problem here in the Boston area, Massachusetts. Gentrification is a huge problem here. It's been a problem for years, and it's I've watched it consistently get worse over time. So I've been here a little over nine years. And similar thing here, we have a lot of jobs here, but they're mainly for people who are college educated. It's a heavily you know, college educated area. It brings in people from all across the country, across the world, but not so much jobs for people who grew up here. So it, it is a big uh, problem here. Um, when you look at, if you were to compare like Northern Virginia and there's Southern Virginia, and then there's the Western part of Virginia. Um, so Virginia is incredibly diverse. Mm -hmm. um, when looking at those three areas, where would you say there is the most need in terms of economic improvement? It's everywhere. But, but you know, so, so every region of Virginia desperately needs um, a change in the way we're handling the economy, but the changes that are needed in the different regions are different. Mm -hmm. So uh, Virginia is the most economically unequal state in America. 
And the United States is the most economically unequal country that's ever been, right? So Virginia very much is the epicenter. We have the wealthiest county in the United States, Loudoun County, Virginia, that doesn't even have full day kindergarten for all of its public school students. We have some of the poorest counties in America down in the coal fields region um, that their economy is just being eroded away uh, by you know, these industries that are leaving one by one by one and there's nothing to replace them except for Walmart and Family Dollar and payday lenders. And those are $7 an hour jobs. You know, even in a place with a low cost of living like Southwest Virginia, seven, eight dollars an hour is not going to cut it. Um, and you, you look at Richmond, for example, there are very, very just tremendously wealthy portions of Richmond where people are doing just fine. And then you go five minutes down the road and you run into a neighborhood that has a school with black mold going up the walls, with windows that don't open. The school building's 120 years old and hasn't been uh, hasn't been renovated in 50 years, you know, so, so there are these problems everywhere in Virginia and they take different shapes everywhere in Virginia, but the rest of the political system here has a one size fits all solution that somehow makes it worse everywhere that it's applied. And that is just bribe these massive corporations to come in and give us jobs and hope that it fixes everything, but it doesn't. So we've got to actually, you know, we've got to stop um, partaking in what I call economic junk food, right? We've got to stop trying to take that shortcut um, and actually do the hard work. We've got to build up new sectors of our economy from the ground up by putting money into the hands of the people here in Virginia who need a different economy and saying, all right, build it. Here's the money you need to build it. It's yours. You will own it. You will operate it. You will control your life. Whether you're in, whether you're at work or at home, this is truly, you know, extending democracy into the one place where we don't have it, the workplace. But, you know, it's it's this principle where if if you're impacted by a decision, you should be the one making the decision, right? That's what democracy is. So we're just bringing that to the economy, um, and I think that that gives much much better results for everyone. Agreed. Um, when you look at Governor Northam's time in office, so I for one have noticed he has not received good press. <laughs> I know I know a little bit more about him than I care to know. Um, but what would you say or where would you say that he went wrong? The place where he went wrong is um, just not breaking with his predecessors. You know, he continued the, the policies of Terry McAuliffe, who's now running to be governor again. Um, and, and Terry McAuliffe continued a lot of the policies of his predecessor, you know, the, the Republican, um, Bob McDonald, right? And, and so the, the, the place where we're falling short the most is on the issues where both parties agree. Uh, because both parties agree that we should just be giving these massive corporations more money. Mm -hmm. Both parties agree that uh, you know, it's, it's fine that we run uh, our taxation system in an incredibly regressive manner that has the poor paying more of their income than the wealthy. And both parties may agree on it, but it's completely morally wrong. Right. Um, so I know that one of the platforms uh, on your campaign is criminal justice reform. Um, one of the things I saw is that you do want to decrease the prison population in Virginia. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Because some people, they hear that and like alarms go off. So could you uh, talk about that a little bit? The U.S. has the highest incarceration rate of any country ever, ever. And second place isn't even close. And it, it's hard to call ourselves the land of the free when we lock up that many people. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's, you know, directly taking people's freedom away. And you justify it by saying, oh, they deserved it because of what they did, blah, blah, blah. But the reality is we are pouring hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into the budgets of police departments and prisons to try to punish people harder and harder and harder in the hope that it will stop people from doing anything criminal, but it doesn't work. It's never worked. The English actually, uh, back before the United States even existed, the English used to hang people for picking pockets. 
they would have public executions for picking pockets and they would catch people picking pockets at the executions. So clearly just punishment alone doesn't work. We've got to look at the actual, the, the root cause of what makes people do things that are against the law. And in the overwhelming majority of cases, it's desperation. It's not having any other option. It's, uh, you know, Aladdin stealing a loaf of bread. Um, but, you know, if, if, if we were to just, just to demonstrate how bad the problem is, if, if Virginia were to release 90% of our prisoners overnight, our incarceration rate would be the same as Japan's. And that's, you know, if we let 90% of people go, then we would come down to Japan's rate, 90%. So I'm not even talking about that, right? I'm talking about building a system that, that rethinks public safety, that thinks, you know, what do we actually need police to be doing versus the list of things that police are actually doing, right? Uh, and... and Instead of having someone with a gun go out and do traffic enforcement, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. That's not going to make things better. Instead of having someone with a gun do uh, welfare checks or, or be the first people called out to deal with someone having a mental health crisis, you know, that person with a gun is more likely to exacerbate the problem um, or to, to give that person who needs help, instead give them a criminal record that puts them in a more desperate situation for the rest of their lives. Instead of that, we need experts who are actually trained to deal with these things to be the ones that are dealing with them and, and leave police for the actual sort of dangerous things that everybody thinks of when they think of police. And instead of locking people away just because we can, right? Locking people away because they had a little bit of heroin, uh, locking people away because uh, they were on probation and they missed a check-in instead of locking people away for all these things, we've got to come up with ways to help them follow the rules instead uh, yeah. and, and help them be more productive, you know, help them get out of the desperate situation that they're in that caused them to miss that probation check-in or that caused them to feel that, you know, the only way I'm going to feel something this week is when I put a needle in my arm, right? We've got to help them. Um, and so as governor, I'm going to push for all of these things through the general assembly I've been a leading advocate for uh, cannabis legalization. You know, I, I was uh, one of the first to put in a cannabis legalization bill back when other Democrats were asking, why the hell are you doing this during an election year? What are you doing to us, right? And, and now we're on the verge of legalizing cannabis just two years later. Uh, getting rid of the death penalty. I put in a, a bill to get rid of the death penalty last year. It never even got a hearing, but this year we're abolishing the death penalty. Um, and so, you know, I, I've, I've proven through my four years in the General Assembly that I, I'm willing to be that, that first penguin off the cliff uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and bring up these issues and say something needs to change that gets everybody thinking about it. And I'm going to keep doing that as governor. And whether the General Assembly cooperates with me or not, as governor, I will use the power of clemency to make sure that our prison population goes down, even if I have to sign thousands of clemency petitions myself, because this situ the situation that we have right now is completely untenable. We are destroying people's lives, we are destroying families, we're destroying communities, and we're bankrupting our governments, and we're saying it's all for the greater good, but it just makes things worse. Agreed. Um, I can tell you, we legalize cannabis here in Massachusetts and we have cannabis shops. Um, mm -hmm. It has been really good for the economy. <laughs> that's, that's definitely for yeah. sure. And at the same time, we still have all these people who are in prison because of cannabis from like old sentencing. Like, mm -hmm. Why are we putting people in jail for 20 years for, for cannabis? And at the same time, it's like, why are we not letting those people go? Like it's legal right. now and you're still gonna make them serve a 20 year sentence. Not to mention there are some people that are in the prison system just because they can't afford cash bail. I had a bill to get rid of that too. <laughs> um, this is, uh, you know, one of the, one of the wild things uh, about running for governor is people bring up these issues and I'm always like, oh yeah, I put in a bill for that and it didn't get a hearing, right? I put in a bill to fix that, nobody cared. Mm -hmm. But but these are the things that I'm hearing from people, right? People outside of the political system, people that don't have these 
uh, these political connections, you know, not not the lawyers, not the people at the, the Chamber of Commerce, but people that are living their lives, the things that people that are just trying to live their lives care about, the rest of the politicians around me don't care. Um, but, you know, you mentioned uh, the, the disparities in cannabis legalization. That's something that um, I'm actually incredibly disappointed uh, with the, the bill that uh, went through the General Assembly this year because of, because it doesn't address those disparities. Right, um, you know, I, I put in a bill last year that said that if you know it was, it was sort of looking forward, expecting cannabis legalization to come. I said, uh, you know, if there's somebody who has a criminal record for uh, a crime which is no longer a crime, mm -hmm. automatically expunged. Right, if they have a felony conviction for something that's now a misdemeanor, automatically resentenced down to a misdemeanor. Period. Right, because if the General Assembly says it shouldn't be illegal anymore, we shouldn't be punishing people for having done it. Right. Period. You know, it, it just makes sense. Um, but uh, the next governor will have a lot of influence over how cannabis is legalized here in Virginia, um, because the the time frame for legalization is like 2024, um, and so you know that's most of the next governor's term is going to be defined by that. And I hope to be that governor because I want to make sure those disparities are done away with, that we're actually fixing the harm that's been done by this prohibitionary policy. And in fact, I think that every single penny of cannabis tax revenue should go to a fund for reparations for Black and Indigenous Virginians. Because Virginia's government, you know, even outside of cannabis prohibition, Virginia's government has been complicit in some pretty heinous crimes from the genocide of Native Americans to the transatlantic slave trade, redlining, Jim Crow, the ongoing war on drugs, which is still destroying people's lives. We have a lot to atone for. And the cannabis tax is not gonna be big enough to atone for all of it, but we can never atone for any of it until we start. And this is where I wanna start. Right, agreed. Um, when would you say, were you always like politically, were you always a uh, socialist or were you like some people you started off maybe a Democrat and then um, became a socialist? Well, I started off as a, as a Democrat, but um, mostly just because I was disgusted by the Republicans. Uh, and, and so, you know, unfortunately, we, we have a two party system. Uh, and so if you're disgusted by the Republicans, it's the Democrats or nothing. And, and I was always dissatisfied with the way that the Democrats behaved when they got in power. You know, I was glad that the Republicans weren't there anymore, but I wondered why the Democrats couldn't just do good things, right? Why, why do they always have to make it more complicated? Um, you know, growing up in a military family, this is, this is a perfect example, growing up in a military family, the way healthcare worked through my entire childhood, and you know, when I was in the Marine Corps from 18 to 23 was, if you need to see a doctor, you go to medical, you see a doctor, and that's it, yep. right? And so we have this system that already covers millions of people like that, and the Democrats get in power promising that sort of system for everybody, and we end up with tax credits and penalties and subsidies, and you have to go through the marketplace and the website's not going to work, and why? <laughs> why? Why not just use the system that's easy, yep. you know? Um, and so I was always dissatisfied with the way that Democrats behaved when they got into power. And it wasn't until, I mean, I was already a candidate, right? Because I, I made up my mind to run in the 2017 elections back in early 2016. Um, and so I was already running and I heard this guy, Bernie Sanders, you know, this crazy independent from Vermont everybody expected was just going to get 3% in New Hampshire and drop out. Mm -hmm. He's going around the country and he's winning states and, and he's, he's saying the things that I've always thought, right? He's voicing the dissatisfactions that I've always had with the Democratic Party and he's calling himself a socialist. And so I, I quite literally Googled what is socialism, right? Um, and, and I started reading and I just kept reading and kept reading and kept reading and I realized that the word has been misused mm -hmm. for, for a century intentionally. Um, you know, it's not the government controlling everything. Socialism is an umbrella term for any economic system where the people who do the work are the people who own the work that they do. 
that's it, right? Not, not millionaires, billionaires, not Jeff Bezos, not Wall Street. That's the system that we have now. We do the work and they own the work that we do. Yep. But socialism is a system where we do the work and we own the work that we do. And so the more I read, the more I realized these are things I've always thought made sense and wondered why no politician was talking about it. And eventually I realized like, oh, God damn it. You know, this is, this is who I, this is what I am. I didn't know it's what I was. And because I don't believe in, in concealing anything about myself from the public, I believe in, in just being who I am and saying the things that I believe. Um, I had to go out there and tell everybody. And it certainly made life a lot more difficult. <laughs> it is not easy being an elected socialist in the South, you know, working in a building where the Confederacy literally declared war on the United States to preserve the institution of slavery, right? It, it is not easy being a socialist and going to work in that building. Mm -hmm. But it's what I got to do because my conscience won't let me lie to people. Agreed. Um, what do you think has been the most difficult part about running a grassroots campaign? The most difficult part is getting over people's cynicism, you know, especially people that are connected to politics, um, you know, people that have been sort of in the insider world for too long, right? People in the, uh, people in the local Democratic Party committees, um, people in the, the activist organizations that are lobbying the General Assembly all the time, you know, even, even the do-gooders, right? Because there are do-gooders uh, in the lobbying world. Um, even them, there, there's just this cynicism of like, yeah, Lee Carter's great. He's the best one on the issues. We know he's going to fight for us, but why? You know, you know, you know like, like there's, no, there's no chance. And so it's, it's getting over that. It's, it's everybody that I talk to goes, that guy's right on the issues. And then the second question is, okay, so what are you going to do to help? <laughs> right? that's, that's the hardest part. Uh, but the good news is the voters don't have that problem. Right, um, because we're we're not talking about uh, we're, we're not we're not using a strategy of trying to convince regular primary voters, right? The people who show up every single year, twice a year in June and November, right? Those folks already know how they're going to vote, right? Those are the people that will actually research all the candidates. They'll make charts. They'll compare, right? I'm not worried about them. They're going to make the decision. They're going to make. I'm talking about going out and reaching the people who think, why should I bother showing up and give them a reason to show up? And, and you know, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. If you vote for me, I'm going to fight every single day until I don't have any fight left in me to make your life better. And you know, I'm going to do it because I don't take money from the people that are making your life worse. Right. I'm going to fight to lower your rent. And, you know, I'm going to do it because I'm not taking money from your landlord. I'm going to fight to lower your power bill. And, you know, I'm going to do it because I'm not taking money from the power company. It really is that simple. And and the voters know that it's that simple. But the politicians, the, the lobbyists, the people that that show up every day at the General Assembly just can't get it through. Right. Um, they, they've got that cynicism of like, good things don't happen here. <laughs> and, and, and that's, that's the hardest thing to fight against is that mindset of it's good. So it must be doomed to fail. Right. And as we can see from, you know, the democratic presidential election for 2020, mm -hmm. a lot of Americans wanted the things that Bernie was talking about. And honestly, had it not been for the mainstream media, you know, making him to seem like this, I don't know, evil socialist like person or whatever. I think more people that voted for Biden would have voted for Bernie, but the, the mainstream media, they really were toxic around that as well. Well, yeah. I mean, you look at, you look at the ballot initiatives that passed, right? Raising the minimum wage passed in Florida by an overwhelming majority while the party that claims to want to raise the minimum wage lost Florida. Yep. Why? Uh, it's because people don't believe the Democrats are actually going to do it. And then you've got Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema out there tanking the policy, right? 
uh, and looking gleeful while they're doing it. That's why people don't think Democrats are going to do it because mm -hmm. Democrats are too worried about not making Joe Manchin look bad. Screw Joe Manchin. Help millions of people. If Joe Manchin wants to oppose that, let him own that. But be the ones owning helping people. It, it, the political calculations don't have to be that complicated, right? Um, we're not we're not in an episode of House of Cards here. <laughs> this isn't the West Wing. Nobody cares about bipartisanship. They care about whether or not they can pay the rent. Help them pay the rent, and they'll love you forever. It's what FDR did. Now, granted, you know, asterisk on FDR's legacy. There there were a lot of horrible things that happened during his presidency, but. But generally, you know, there's a reason that he's the only president to be elected four times. And it's because of the New Deal. It's because he put money in people's pockets at a time when people didn't have enough money in their pockets. Yep. How is this hard to understand? Agree. Totally agree. All right, Lee, I have one more question for you. When is the governor election for Virginia? So the primary is June 8th but we have 45 days of early voting leading up to that. Um, and, you know, Virginia has not elected a Republican to statewide office since 2009. So um, really the primary is going to decide who the governor is barring, you know, some crazy act of God between June and November. Uh, the election for governor is pretty much the primary on the democratic side. So um We've got a very, very short time period to get up with people um, and, and let them know that that's the reality and that they're deciding in June who the governor is going to be. Um, but I'm confident that we're going to be able to do it. Uh, but in order to do it, I need everybody's help. Um, you know, I've never taken a single dime from for-profit corporations or industry interest groups. I never have. I never will. And I'm the only candidate on the Democratic side that can say that. Um, and so I need everybody watching this to go to carterforvirginia.com. That's all one word, all spelled out, carterforvirginia.com. There's a button that says donate. There's a button that says volunteer. Um, both of those are incredibly helpful, and that's how we're going to win this thing. It's going to be through people power. We're never going to spend more money than the corporate juggernauts, but we can definitely talk to more people. Awesome. I'll be sure to put the link to Lee's campaign site in the description below. And Lee, thanks so much for joining me today. This was very, very helpful. Of course. And thank you so much for having me. All righty. Talk to you later. All right. Bye.